up today from the King James text, Matthew 12, 1 through 14 reads, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was an hungered? And they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And, they, and he asked, excuse me, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? that they might accuse him. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. What a response to healing a man. Mm -hmm. They immediately go out and have a meeting to figure out how they can destroy him. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of religion, folks. Will you bow your heads with me a moment? Father, once again, God, we come before you. Lord, I always implore you and ask you, God, to anoint me because I've been in this thing my whole life and I understand, God, today that there is not a word I could speak that would benefit the people of God except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If any man on this planet needs the anointing, I need it today. I need you, Lord, to touch my body, to touch my mind, but most of all, to quicken my spirit that I might speak that which ought to be spoken and refrain from speaking that which is unneeded and unnecessary. Let every word that comes forth from my mouth today, O oh God, be a word from heaven. Lord, that it might be spiritual food for the hearer, those in this place, those watching by reason of the Internet. We ask it all, Father, today in that blessed name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. There is so much that is not understood and that is not appreciated from the Word of God because people have at best a cursory understanding of the material. And what I mean by that today is the topic of the passage that we've read today is actually the Sabbath day. Amen. It's talking about things that are done on the Sabbath and how that related to the law of Moses. 
Jesus and his disciples were walking through a cornfield. That's why I have that picture there today. Just a field to give you an idea, to give you some visual of what it would be like for them to walk through a large field of uh, vegetables, in this case corn, and they were hungry. So they began to pluck off ears of corn and to peel the husk away and, and to begin to eat that corn. My, what a sinful, horrible, terrible thing to do! While the Pharisees saw them doing this, and they grew so upset and they got so angry, and they went to Jesus and they said, Don't you notice what your disciples are doing? It's funny how religious folk are always looking at what everybody else is doing. Hello now. It's funny how, you know, I preached last time that it's a personal matter. Instead of worrying about whether or not they were breaking the Sabbath, they were more interested in looking at Jesus and his disciples to see whether they were breaking the Sabbath. Hello now. They wanted to apply their standard. They wanted to apply their conviction to Jesus and to his disciples. Why don't you just leave them alone and let them answer to God for their own actions? Amen. Amen. No, because religious folk don't do that. No, religious folk are so busy trying to get everybody around them to uh, live up to the same code that they live up to. Because after all, isn't that what religion's all about? Conformity. It's all religion's about. <laughs> the Lord looks at them. He said, well, hadn't you ever heard of what... David did when he got hungry and the people that were with him, they went into the temple and they began to eat the meat and the bread that was there offered in sacrifice. And according to the law, it was not lawful for him to do that. That was only to be consumed by the priests. Said, uh, furthermore, let me ask you a question. I'm going to go down a little bit further in the passage when they begin to ask him about healing. He said, now what, what one of you that has a sheep that falls into a ditch isn't going to reach down in that ditch or jump down in that ditch and lift that sheep out of the ditch? Well, I've got news for you. According to the law, that is work, and you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to engage in any kind of work. So therefore, uh, you ought to leave that sheep in the ditch for a day or so until the, the uh, Sabbath is complete, and then you go out and get it. Well, you can't do that, Johnny, because by then the wolves will have gotten it. By then the bears will have gotten it. So no, you can't leave it in there indefinitely. Of course you're going to get down there and you're going to rescue that sheep. Of course you're going to do that. Why, that's only the common sense thing. i got news for you today, folks. Christianity is a common sense faith. Hallelujah. It is a common sense religion. It does not approach things from a ridiculously unrealistic perspective. Even though that is the way it's preached to us by many of our favorite TV preachers. Mm -hmm. Many of our favorite pastors. Many of our favorite denominations have taken Christianity and turned it into some rigid, legalistic set of laws and demands and edicts. But this pastor's been called by God today to inform you that Christianity is a common sense faith. Jesus approached the issue of the Sabbath with common sense. He said, if you're hungry, it only makes sense that you're going to do what you got to do to eat. Hello now. If you're hungry, of course you're going to reach out and grab an ear of corn. These men did not go into the field to collect corn. They did not go into the field to reap the harvest. They did not go into the field to work. Hello now. No, what they were doing just made common sense. They were hungry, and they were merely taking an ear of corn off to eat it. He said that same common sense applies when you look at the issue of 
the sheep falling into a ditch. He said, it's only common sense that you're going to get that sheep out the minute it falls in that ditch. Because if you leave it there, it may not even take a day. It may only take a few hours. That wolf or that bear or that lion is going to hear that sheep ba ba coming out of that hole. And you better believe that animal's going to go in and get his meal. Why, that's as good as being served on a plate for him. He don't have to chase it. He don't have to run after it. He doesn't have to do nothing but get down in the ditch with it and eat it. Hello now. Jesus said, I'm here to tell you, you've got to use some common sense. They came to him with the purpose of entrapping him. Now, here's a man we know you love running around healing people. Here's a man with a withered hand. Uh, let me ask you, is it good to heal on the Sabbath? It's another thing religious folk love to do. They love to set traps for you. They love to ask you questions that they think they already know the answer to. Hello now. They love to ask you questions that they think they already know the answer to. And they're just waiting for you to give the wrong answer by their estimation. Mm -hmm. And that's when Jesus began to talk to them about the lamb falling in a ditch. But you know what? He also talked to them about the fact that on the Sabbath day, listen to this now, this is interesting. He said, In verse 5, when he first was talking to them about the disciples pulling corn off the stalk. Verse 5, he said, Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Well, what in the world did the Lord mean by that? What does he mean that on the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? Honey, the Sabbath is their work day. That's the one day a week they work. That's the day. That's the day. Sunday's the day the preacher works. Hello now. Wednesday's the day the preacher works. No, the very days that you're off and you get to sit and listen, i got to get up here and work. The priests had to offer sacrifices. They had to slaughter animals. They had to go into the temple and they had to lead worship. They had to do all these things. And in so doing, by reason of the fact they were working, they were profaning the Sabbath. Yet these are the very men that God has called to help you and I to keep the Sabbath. You see, nothing in life is perfect. There, there's an exception. I preached a message many years ago. and One day I, I may preach some form of it in this church. There's an exception to every rule. Hello now. You see, in order for the Sabbath to be the Sabbath, somebody had to work on the Sabbath. In this case, it's the priest. In order for church to be church, somebody's got to work on the Lord's Day. In this case, it's the preacher. It's the choir. It's the worship leader. It's the pianist. It's the organist. Hello now. A lot of synagogues today in the Jewish faith do not use at least certain musical instruments in their worship. And the reason they do not use these instruments is because of this. Listen to this. For instance, a guitar. If you're playing a guitar and the string breaks, you would have to break the Sabbath to fix the string. That doesn't seem like much to you and I, does it? It's like, oh, string breaks, no big deal. It just fix the string. It's not that big a deal. But according to Jewish law, you're to do no work on the Sabbath. You see, there is no common sense. How many laws exist in our country today? And there is absolutely no common sense in the universe applied to that law. 
when you look at the law from a common sense perspective, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Sometimes you drive down a road and you pass a sign after sign that says speed limit 40 miles an hour and you're out in the middle of the boondocks and you can see for miles and you say to yourself that makes no sense you could easily travel 60 miles an hour on this road who cares you know it's not a heavily trafficked road there's not a lot of cars you can see for miles it's a good road why in the world would the speed limit be only 40 miles an hour so a lot of laws in our world today that really defy common sense. And when we wind up getting a ticket or we wind up getting stopped by a cop, what is our defense? Why, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> How many of us have said that to a police officer? It just doesn't make, or we get in front of the judge. It just doesn't make any sense. That I would only be able to go this speed on this road, right? Of course, what you don't know that they do know is that there are cows that are pastured all along that road. And those cows are not fenced in. Tommy and I going to Oklahoma the other day, I said to him, I said, do you know we just passed a field full of cows and there's no fence on that field. It dawned on me. I realized there's no fence on that field. Those cows can come into the road anytime they want to. Of course, it's funny. They don't generally, because as long as they've got grass to eat where they're at, they're going to stay where they're at, right? Yep. But you see, sometimes the law makes no sense to us simply because we don't understand all the factors involved. Maybe those out in the country who set the 40 mile an hour law know, yeah, you can see quite a ways ahead of you, but you need to be able to see because there may be a cow standing out in the middle of the road and you need to be able to slow down and stop before you hit it. Mm -hmm. Because if you hit it, not only are you going to kill a cow, there's a good chance you're going to kill yourself and your passengers. Hello now. That's right. But Christianity is a common sense religion. Religion in and of itself seeks to establish mandates and rules. But Christianity has at its foundation a strong sense of practicality. God approaches his creation, that is humankind, with great practicality. In Psalm 103, verses 10 through 14, the Word of God reads, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Listen to this, verse 14, Psalm 103. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Sounds to me like God approaches things pretty practically. I know what these people are made out of. <laughs> I know what make. I know their makeup. I understand what makes. Them. I made them, so I know exactly what they're made of. You bake a cake, you know exactly what's in that cake. Hello now. You don't know there's eggs in it, you know how many eggs. You don't know there's oil in it, you know how much oil. You don't know there's vanilla in it, you know how much vanilla. You don't know how much flour, or excuse me, you don't know there's flour in it, you know how much flour. Hello now. You, if you bake it, you know it intimately. God made us! And he understands what we're made out of! He understands your emotional makeup. He understands your psychological makeup. He understands your physiological makeup. Oh, isn't this good news for the LGBT believer today? Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, that just about makes me want to shout a while. Hallelujah. He understands me. 
It doesn't matter if Franklin Graham understands me. My creator understands me. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. He doesn't just know there's flour in this cake. He knows how much flour. And he knows whether or not that flour was sifted. Hello now. My Lord have mercy. Christianity has at its core, Johnny, common sense. Every time you turned around, Jesus was being accused of breaking the law of Moses. He was being accused of not being obedient to Torah, as the Jewish people would say. And he would turn around and say, just look at it with a little common sense. Just look at this practically. You say we're breaking the Torah because these men are peeling off an ear of corn and eating it. They're not going out into the middle of the field to reap the harvest. They're not going out there to gather all the corn on all the stalks so they can bring it into the barn, so they can bring it to market. They're not working. Hello now. They're not working. But you've turned the law into an issue of exacts. You've turned the law into an issue of uh, common sense gets thrown out the window. I will tell you, most churches today you go into common sense gets thrown out the window. Yeah, yeah they don't want to deal with science. They don't want to deal with facts. They don't want to, don't bother me with facts. Please don't bother me with any facts. Don't tell me that LGBT people are the way they are because scientifically, somehow, some way, they're wired that way. Don't tell me that. Doesn't matter how many LGBT people try to share their experience with them. Doesn't matter how many people try to tell them. Listen, I got news for you. I was wired like this. When I was a kid, I thought a certain way. When I was a child, I was looking at people a certain way. And it didn't have a thing in the universe to do with sex either, Johnny, did it? Nope. No, it was just an issue of attraction. It was an issue of affection. You know, had nothing to do with sex. I didn't even know what sex was back then. But I knew that my heart fluttered when certain boys come around and, and I found myself kind of developing a crush on them. You know what I'm talking about? Doesn't have anything, didn't have nothing to do with it. But see, don't, don't talk to me about those things. Because common sense would dictate that if a person didn't choose it, then a person can't change it. Hello now. That's what common sense would tell us. And by God, we sure enough don't want to have to deal with common sense. No, we, we believe there's a higher law. We believe there's a higher mandate. You have no idea today how many Christians don't understand this passage that we've read today. Do you have any idea how important the issue of the Sabbath was to the Jewish faith. This was not some little tiny issue, Johnny. The Sabbath was not some little tiny thing that, you know, oh well, you know, this is one of our minor laws. Oh no, 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 no. The Sabbath was one of their most important central laws, partly because the Sabbath is one of those laws that help to separate and differentiate the Jewish people from all the other world religions and all the other world peoples. So the Sabbath was an extremely, extremely important issue. And the fact that Jesus' disciples were plucking corn on the Sabbath, this was not a minor offense to these Pharisees. This was a major offense. This was something that really got under their craw. Why, there are issues in our lives today that some people don't look at as minor. They don't look at it as, oh, it's just another sin like any other sin. Oh, no, Johnny, it's a whole great, big, enormous, powerful oh, yeah. sin. It's the biggest sin. I read some writing by a very famous, world-known uh, Jewish rabbi. 
and he wrote on the issue of homosexuality as it is viewed by the Jewish faith and as it is approached in the Jewish community. And one of the things I found interesting, this man said, I know Pat Robertson personally. He said, I have sat down to meals with Pat Robertson. That's how well I know him. He said, Pat Robertson's gone off on a tangent about homosexuality in America. He said, and I've laughed and looked at him and said, what in the world are you people so hung up on that issue for? Why in the world do you people get so caught up on that issue? He said, I cannot understand for the life of me why you try to make it into something so big and so great. And Pat Robertson said, oh, what is the most important issue? you in the world today with his standard ire. And this rabbi said, not by a long shot it ain't. He said, gay and lesbian people are permitted to participate in a synagogue in the community of faith, in the Jewish faith. He said, because they're Jewish. He said, every one of us breaks Torah. Every one of us does something the Torah said don't do. He said according to the Torah, according to the word of God, the Holy Scriptures, to be guilty of one point of the law is to be guilty of all. He said, so what difference does it make which one you break? That's right. How can we stand at the door and tell the gay lesbian person, you cannot come into the temple, you cannot come into the synagogue, because of what you do when I lie, when I defraud, when I do things in business I shouldn't do, when I lust in my heart after a woman that is not my wife. Hello now. See you. They approach things with a whole lot more common sense. If we approach the Word of God with the common sense that God intends for us to approach it with, then we would have as Christians the same identical mindset as they. Who am I to bar gay lesbian people from the church? I am not perfect. I am not sinless. I do not do everything right. Who am I to keep anyone out who is trying their best to do everything they can to live for God? Amen. Who am I? You say, preacher, I don't believe the New Testament allows for that kind of thinking. Oh, really? Then I guess John the Apostle was high or on dope or something when he said, if we say that we have no sin, the truth is not in us. And we make God a liar. Hello now, isn't that what John the Apostle said? You see, he was trying to help keep things in the realms of common sense. They know one of us can say we are sinless. Remember last week, uh, last time we were together, we talked about Paul saying, let us therefore no longer judge one another, but rather judge this, that you put no stone of stumbling or occasion to fall in your brother's way. Yep. You remember that? That's common sense. Rather than approaching one another with judgment and criticalness, why don't we approach one another with the attitude of, I'm going to do everything in the world I can to help you in your walk with God. I may not agree. I may not understand. I may not have my mind around it all. But that's okay. You know why it's okay? I'll tell you why it's okay. We read it today in our primary, uh, in our uh, text in Psalm 103. As the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. For as, the, uh, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The word of God tells us as far as the east is from the west, that is how, or as far as the heavens are above the earth, that is how far removed God's understanding is. And his ways, the word of God tells us, are past finding out. 
You know, when we come together in church and we study the Word of God, and when the preacher gets up and preaches, I got news for you, honey. We're just scratching the top of the barrel. We're, we're just covering the most basic things about God that can be covered. We're, there's a lot we're not going to understand until we get yonder. Hello Amen. now. There's a lot we're not going to understand until we get to heaven because His ways are past finding out. His understanding is so far above ours. Now do you get where it makes a little common sense to let anybody come into the house of God that wants to worship Him? Now do you understand the Word of God said, let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord! Amen. So if a queen or a queer wants to come into the house of God and worship Him, i got news for you. According to Scripture, they ought to be welcome. Because you are no more perfect than they. You are no more sinless than they. It just makes common sense. And Christianity is a common sense Christianity. It's not some high ethical law that... Uh, is so, you know, lofty and we're all supposed to uh, abide by every rule and every regulation or else we have no right to even walk into the house of God because if that were true, there's not a church today that would have so much as a preacher in the pulpit. Right. I got news for you, the preacher in this pulpit's far from perfect. I'll be even more honest with you. Since I've been doing affirming ministry, I have struggled. I've told you this before. I have struggled, Johnny. I have struggled. I have struggled. I have struggled. I am a results-driven person. I am a person, I like to see my results. I like to see them. I don't, I, I don't want somebody telling me, Amy, who is one of our good friends and supporters, she and her uh, boyfriend were down in Dallas this week. You know, they didn't get to be with us in church last Sunday, which worked out just as well because we wound up without power. But they had come into Dallas driving uh, on business because Amy had a training uh, session seminar to go to. And she and Tommy and I and uh, her boyfriend Clint, we all went out to dinner on Tuesday night. Uh, and uh, Amy said what so many other people have said, including my mom. She said, Pastor, you have no idea how much your ministry means to people like me. She said, you have no idea how much you're touching people and you're helping people. Just because your local church in Dallas isn't growing and isn't uh, prospering like you'd like it to, and just because you're not uh, burgeoning, you know, and you're not seeing the, uh, the, the place filled up from rafter to rafter, she said, believe me, you are touching far more lives than you ever can even imagine. Well, thank you, Amy, for saying that. Doesn't help a whole lot. <laughs> because, Bill, I, I like to see my results. Yeah. I like to see what's happening. I, let me tell you, furthermore, I've got a vision for a church in Dallas that would blow the city of Dallas off its rocker. I, I've got a vision for a church. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, we would have people at I'm going to name it. We'd have people at Potter's house looking our way and saying, my Lord, look at that church. I don't mean in terms of size. I don't mean in terms of the number of people who are attending. I'm talking about in terms of the variety and the level of ministries that we would offer. I've got a vision that is so big and so great. There are so many things I would love to be able to do. I see people struggling every day. I see young people running away from homes where their parents have disowned them because of who they are. And they come into a big city like Dallas or New York or San Francisco. And many of them wind up on drugs. Many of them wind up prostituting themselves just to be able to eat. They're not doing this, folks, because that's their preferred uh, choice of way to make a living. That's not why they're doing it. I knew many people when I lived in New York City, it broke my heart. I knew many people in New York City whose lives were just rotting away. They were doing things they never dreamed they'd be doing, like the prodigal son. All because 
somebody in their family and toss them away like trash. All because that person didn't understand that Christianity is a common sense religion. It only makes sense that God would have me love my child regardless of what my child does or who my child does it with. Hello now. Right. It only makes sense. The Word of God said, Fathers, love your children. Doesn't it? Yeah. That's not a suggestion. It's a command. It doesn't say that if they're sinful in your mind, if they do things you don't like, that you suddenly have a license no longer to love them. It says, husbands, love your wives. It doesn't say if your wife does something you don't like. It doesn't say if your wife drives you up the wall that you suddenly have a license not to love her, does it? No, it does not. So it only makes common sense that you've got to learn to love your wife even if there are things there that drive you nuts. Hello now. you got to learn to love your children even if there are things there you disagree with and you dislike them. I tell them the truth today. The biggest issue that causes parents to throw their children away is not their desire for holiness and righteousness. It's their pride. They're embarrassed. All people in the church are going to think that I don't know how to control my own house. People in the church are going to think that I don't know how to control my own children. Yes, yeah, so throw your child away like trash. That makes perfect sense. That'll fix their perception, won't it? That'll fix how they view you. You nincompoop. Good Lord, have mercy. Christianity is a common sense faith, folks. If you rightly divide the Word of God, the Word of God tells us, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. If you rightly divide the Word of God, line upon line, Precept, you hear me say that all the time, all the time, all the time. Precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. If you put this whole thing together like a puzzle, like you're supposed to, and you put it all together, guess what? The biggest word you're going to read is love. Amen. And you are not going to find one single exception to that rule. Absolutely not. You're right. I was thinking about a political figure this week that I can't stomach. <laughs> I won't name any names. I was thinking about this individual and I thought to myself, I said, God, I, I hate that man worse than I hate anything in this world. I, I can't stomach that human being. I cannot stomach him. I've never seen anything so grotesque and ugly in my life. And I sat there and I thought and I said, but Lord, you know what? I know you love him. Somehow, God, you're able to love that man. I don't know how in the world you do it. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but you're able to love that man. I've heard things about this person's background and upbringing. And, and, and they talk about, you know, how he became the way he is today. And I have pity on that. I do. I honestly pity the man for having gone through that. But you know what? the finished product is still ugly. <laughs> I don't care what went into the process and created the finished product. The finished product is ugly, no matter how you slice it, in my mind, okay? <sighs> but God's ways are not my ways, and my ways are not God's ways. And if that person showed up at my door and said, I'm hungry, I'm about to pass out. I need something to eat. Would I or would I not feed that person? Well, I, now that's a hypothetical, and it's not even worth me offering an answer because we don't know what we do unless we actually had to do it. I could stand here and sound spiritual and say, why, of course I would do it, you know? When in reality, I'd probably slam the door in his face and say, yeah, whatever, I'll call somebody to pick your body up in the morning. You know, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> But I'm trying to help us understand today. Jesus was addressing one of the core issues of the Jewish faith, the Sabbath. 
They did everything in their power. They pointed out what he and his disciples were doing. They pointed out the sins of the other guy like so many religious love to do. They even went so far as to try to entrap him. Asking him a question that they figured they already knew the right answer to. I love when people say, is it biblical for a man to marry a man? Because they think they know Johnny and Bill and Tommy. They think they know already what the right answer is, right? See, I already know what the right answer is, so I'm, I'm just asking this question. Uh, I don't know, was it biblical for Jonathan and David to make a covenant with one another and to literally pledge their lives to one another? Was it biblical for Jonathan to get naked in front of David? Get naked in front of David? What are you talking about? Read your Bible, honey. As part of his vow, he got naked. Handed David his clothes and his sword. Was that biblical? Was that right? I got news for you. According to the law of Moses, that would have been very, very questionable behavior. There are a lot of questions that people ask and they think they already know the answer. But I told you last time and I'm telling you again, if you're not living with that issue, it's not your issue. Don't fight that fight. If it's not your issue, God could care less what your opinion on that issue is. Oh, but I'm supposed to influence people to do the right thing. Really? Where do you read that? What passage of the scriptures tell you that you're supposed to help other people? My Bible said, uh, judge not least you be judged. It also says that you're not supposed to look at the toothpick in the other guy's eye when you got a beam in your own. I don't understand where you get that mentality. You're supposed to help other people to live right and to make the right choices and to do the right things. Oh, the Bible said, He that converted the sinner covereth a multitude of sin. Um, a sinner folk as in an unbeliever. If you help to bring someone into the fold, if you help someone into the faith, You've covered a multitude of sin. It, it's not about helping a gay person not to be gay. It's not about helping a drunk person not to drink. It's not about helping a, a, a whoremonger not to sleep around with a bunch of women. No, that's not what that passage is dealing with at all. It's talking about people who have backslidden, people who have left the faith. And if you are instrumental and if you're able to help them come back into the fold, I got news for you today. That's, that's one of the primary functions of this ministry is restoration and reconciliation, trying to help people get back into their place in the house of God. I'm going to bring things to a quick close today. Some of our friends online, you may notice we have a lightning storm going on. And I don't necessarily want to be standing here with a microphone <laughs> in my hand while we've got a... I know people who have been on the telephone when lightning struck, and it uh, gave them a permanent perm. So, <laughs> so I'm going to bring this to a swift close today. The Word of God said in Luke chapter 7, verses 31 through 35... And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. The ends justifies the means. The Lord said, I approach things one way, John approaches things another way, but we both get it done. And you know what? You folks condemn both of us. 
got news for you today. If you were straight as an arrow, if you were married to a woman today and you went to first church down the road, they'd have still preached you into hell. They'd have still told you you were missing the mark. They'd have still found a way to make you believe that your Christian experience was short of perfection and you still weren't doing just right and you still weren't worthy of heaven and God's grace still did not apply to you because of something you did this week or something you said or somewhere you went. Hello now. Got news for you, honey. If you think changing your sexual orientation is all of a sudden going to make uh, first church down the road accept you and approve of you and all of a sudden you're going to be okay with them, uh, you don't know very much about Christianity in America today anyway. <laughs> Lord said, John came, he approached things one way, you said he had a devil. I approached things another way, you say I'm a glutton and a wine bibber. You're not going to please men, so why do you even try? Christianity is a practical matter. It's also a personal matter. It's Romans 8, 1 through 4, almost done today. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You and I today have what is commonly referred to as diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic community. We're citizens of heaven, but we're living on earth. And God said the law of sin and death does not apply to you. If you're a representative from a foreign nation and you live on American soil, guess what? You have diplomatic immunity. You can park your car anywhere you want to park your car. You can drive your car any speed you want to drive your speed. Because if you get stopped by a cop, guess what? I'm a diplomat. I'm a foreign diplomat. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Go on your way. The laws don't apply to you. Hello now. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? For what the law could not do, could not do, not did not do, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled, not achieved or attained, there's a difference that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If your faith is squarely placed in a crucified, buried, and resurrected Jesus Christ, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. You, hallelujah, and glory to God. The difference between the way God treats the saint and the sinner today is not how well the saint follows the rules. That's not the difference in the way God treats the saint and the sinner. The way that God treats the saint and the sinner differently is based on his relationship with those individuals. When we come into relationship with him, his attitude and his approach toward us immediately changes by grace. You can watch a mother stand and her kid can be doing something and the neighbor's kid can be doing the same thing. I guarantee you that mother doesn't approach the her kid and the neighbor's kid the same way, do they? That's right. Why? Because the rules don't apply to the neighbor's kid or the rules don't apply to her kid? No, that's not why. It has to do with her relationship to that child. Am I telling the truth? I got news for you today. 
That is the difference between saint and sinner. God becomes our father. Hello now. We become his children. And what does the word of God say about how God approaches his children? Psalm 103, 10. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. So what is the difference? Where does the mercy go? Toward them that what? Fear him. What does it have to do with? It has to do with relationship. It doesn't have to do with following rules, obeying edicts. It has to do with relationship. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Listen, like as a father pitieth his children. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And what did we finish with? Verse 14, Psalm 103. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Let the neighbor's kid ride his bike into a tree and bang his head. And your father might look and laugh a little bit and say, what a dummy. Let you do it. And see if your father doesn't come running and saying, are you okay? Hello now. What's the difference? The relationship. I got news for you today. We serve a good God today. Hallelujah. Amen. We serve a merciful God. We serve a God who honors those that fear him. He honors us. He removes our transgressions from us. He does not deal with us the way we ought to be dealt with. But rather, he's merciful. He's loving, and it's based on relationship, not rules and regulations. Why? Because Christianity today is a common sense faith. We serve a God today with common sense Christianity. Would you stand with me today? Amen. Praise God.